broadcast where we put you on the map. This is Ron Costa broadcasting live in the Mappable USA studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. And today, folks, we're going to set the record straight again on real estate crowdfunding, specifically with Opportunity Zones. And before we do that, let's bring in Vicki Hutchmala from the QOZ Marketplace and the Opportunity Zones Authority. Vicki, how are you doing today? I'm doing outstanding today, Ron. Beautiful day in Vegas. The sun is shining. It's warm. We have an excellent guest today, and we're going to talk about opportunity zones and why they're special and the good things about them. I can't wait. Exactly. Exactly. And our, our guest today is a repeat guest. So let's bring him in right now. But let's everyone let's welcome David Silliman. He's the CEO of Easy Do It. David, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Ron. Vicky, a uh, pleasure again. Thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. Oh, it's well, always a pleasure, David. Oh, likewise, now, Ron. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, David, you know, you're you're one of the uh, the big uh, movers and shakers in this opportunity zones uh, marketplace in, in in the whole space. So I, I don't know if anyone has heard our previous podcast with you, but just really quickly, let's go over what uh, Easy Do It does and, and and what you're concentrating on in opportunity zones in particular. Sure. Uh, Easy Do It is a turnkey fund development uh, agency. We set up opportunity funds for client sponsors, uh, both real estate. Our specialty is business, working with business owners and setting up opportunity funds to uh, invest in their businesses in opportunity zones. Um, to date, we've set up uh, just under $16 billion. I think we're at like $15.8 billion worth of opportunity funds. Uh, at any given time, it's one out of every six, one out of every seven in the market space we've set up. Um, uh, probably 90% of all the business-based funds out there we've set up. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's impressive numbers for sure. Now, these people come to you, David, and they, they pretty much know about Opportunity Zones in particular, or, or are they coming in and you're kind of uh, consulting with them about how to get this thing done, or, or, or do they have the mindset that they definitely want to fund? Well, we get a little bit of a mixture of both. When it comes to the businesses, I would say probably 7 out of 10 have no idea really how, what, why, when, nothing on, in, in the way of opportunity zones and what it can really do for their business. Um, the real estate individuals that we speak with, they have a little bit more of an idea, but again, that's a little bit par for course given all things considered with how, you know, over the last 18 months have unfolded in this space. You know, we've predominantly been real estate in the beginning, and now we're starting over the last 100 days. You know, we've seen about a 4% movement, a 4% growth uh, in, in what this curve looks like in, in focusing on uh, businesses and opportunity zones. Well, I think that the businesses aspect of it is really the important part for the long-term success of the program because the businesses are going to bring the jobs. It's going to sustain the area. It's going to make everything grow. The real estate is really sexy and all, but uh, – you know, doing the business part of it is, is, is the part that is really going to make it a winner or a loser, I think. And I, I think you guys are really in the right part doing those kind of funds. Well, thank you. We're, we're so, really trying. Yeah. Try not. We, just have, we have a passion to see jobs get created. We have a passion just to see the impact happen in these opportunity zones. We, we believe in it. So, yeah, if I, some, I, so when somebody comes to you, are they coming with money to invest in a business in an opportunity zone, or is it a business that says, I'd like to be in an opportunity zone, can you help us find one? Um, well, the program, just because of the way that uh, the guidelines are with the 80-20 rules, we don't get many investors themselves that are looking to set up funds. Um, the investors are more inquisitive as far as what funds that we've developed and how they can get in contact with those fund managers directly through us. Um, with the businesses, it's more of really just educating them um, on really what an opportunity fund can do how an opportunity fund can actually, you know, help them grow their business, help them retain their equity, help them, um, you know, do away with the need for venture capital, which is a conversation in of entirety of itself that we could have uh, for another hour on a podcast on just talking about what this is going to have an impact in the VC world. But, um, you know, th there's a lot of benefits to business owners with setting up an opportunity fund and using the proceeds of that opportunity fund to invest into the growth of their business. 
Okay, so so let's let's get into this whole uh, uh, argument, not argument, but just controversy about whether or not opportunity zones are even working or not. Uh, the other day, I saw that you put up a, a video, David, that has just been, I guess it's going viral <laughs> in the opportunity zone space, but you've hit on some really, really good points. I was wondering maybe we could talk about some of the stuff that you were you mentioned on that video. And by the way, I'll, I'll um, embed that video into the show notes on this thing so if everyone could see it. It's about what, I think it was like 20 minutes long or something like that? That's like 14 minutes. It's basically me kind of ranting. <laughs> 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 well, everybody needs to rant sometimes, but yeah. I, I thought you made some really good good points in that in that video for sure. And um, you know the 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 idea behind one of the big points I really liked about it was the fact that uh, so many people are kind of like knocking it when there's there really hasn't been a whole lot of time involved in in it to really kind of show like a massive success. So uh, that was really uh, I thought the best point in the whole thing. Yeah, you know, I I got I did that because I had been reading some articles, and I don't I'm not going to name names, but there's you know some congressional representatives that are uh, you know bringing up bills that are going to ultimately go nowhere, but they want to do away with the program. And what concerns me is is that we've taken so much bipartisan effort to be able to put together a piece of legislation, and you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater when the reality is they haven't even reported yet. I mean, we're still technically, from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, what opportunity fund is reported to the IRS? We're still working on a draft, you know, uh, IRS document. We don't even have the official, we've got an idea of what it's going to be, we, a real good idea. But even from the reporting, we've got two bills up in Congress right now that are one in the House, one in the Senate, that are both addressing some of the reporting concerns. And so the opportunity funds themselves haven't even had a chance to really physically report what they're spending the money on yet. What we're, what we're basing this off of it's headlines. It's opportunity funds that are coming out and you know doing press releases saying, hey, we were we're setting up a fund, or hey, we've 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 raised money, and this is where we're putting the money towards. And okay, now we're putting money towards it, and this is what we're doing, and the jobs we're creating. But it's not based off of actual data that's been filed directly from the funds up to this point. It's been it's been all press press releases that's out there. And when you take that, and then you take the idea that there was already. A, a, a stigmatism of, of, of you know with with a certain aspect on the left, and, and I'm not getting political, but there was a stigmatism right. that this was a, a, a tax benefit for the wealthy. And the reality of it is, is no, that this was a tax initiative to help spur job growth, to create jobs, to to have money to come into these economically distressed areas that were all identified locally, approved by the states, and submitted by the states to the treasury and to the government. So yeah, this is sometimes so people are just too political and don't even know what they're talking about and trash the program that is very beneficial to to the guy who's looking for a job, to the business who wants to develop and to make the communities better, but they have no information to back up what they're saying, and it's very so frustrating. Can, so I'll give you a prime example. We've you know I can list on one hand five different business space opportunity funds that collectively between the five of them are going to hire thousands of people. They're going to create collectively thousands and thousands of jobs. And that's five. What, is it, what does it look like when this has time to really grow? When we, when we talk where the job growth, especially the real, real job growth, not, not the short term, because we can look at the construction side of this and the real estate aspect of the opportunity zone. So we can say, well, there, we've got job growth already going on now. We know for a fact that there's already been money that's been deployed into the opportunity zones. Shovels are already breaking the ground. Jobs have already been created. There's no doubt about that, none whatsoever. But in the real estate side of stuff, a lot of those jobs are, are going to be short-term in nature. They're going to be you know, 12 months, 18 months, uh, you know, 24, 36 months. But once the project's over, it's on to the next real estate job with the business job numbers and they have not been reflective yet because this has not had enough time to even catch on with businesses enough to have the awareness let alone the acceptance from it i mean when you look at the business aspect of it the handcuffs for businesses didn't even come off this program until april of this year by the time you figure a you know a 90 to 100 day just you know hey this is real for businesses and a, a moderate understanding of it now you're, you're you know you're talking Business is what, starting to take effect of this in October? We're only December mm -hmm. now. And so right. I, you know, the job potential piece of what this was in intended to do 
is going to be through the roof, through the roof with, with Opportunity Zone programs. What the government needs to do, and not to, again, go off on another rant or anything, but what the government really just needs to be able to do is to look at the program and say, okay, you know, we've got two executive orders, 18 federal different agencies that are involved in this. How do we take everything and continue to, to unlock the program? Not put the program in, into a box out of fear that, oh, there's, you know, one out of, you know, one area that may benefit somebody wealthy, and you're going to hear one story or a couple stories like that. But when you look at the collective good, the greater good across this entire country towards the jobs, the impact, the, the, the economy, everything that comes about of this program, it makes more sense for the government to look at ways that they can unlock and enhance it even more. Looking at things like how the deferment structure is written right now, like, for example, you know, Ron, if you put money in and I put money into an opportunity fund, if my money's capital gain and your money's not, you worked hard and saved your money, both of us are equal at the seven-year mark. I've now paid tax on my money in, right? Yet I still get, at my 10-year anniversary, I still get a step up in basis to tax-free right. where you don't. That's an example of a, a aspect of it that with just a little bit of clarity could unlock an entire avenue of people saying, hey, I want to deploy not just capital gain money, but any money into an opportunity fund. Um, right. It, the, the government is, it, it's time for the government to, even though this program is in its initial infant stages, it's time for the government to do a little fine tuning to, to clarify what needs to be done, what kind of reporting needs to be done to gather uh, demographics and to gather data in order to get a better picture of the program because there's no history. And I think the lack of history as uh, something to look at and say, yes, this is successful, this is going to work, is creating a lot of problems with the misconception of what opportunity zones are. Because the economy is in such great shape right now, a lot of people have capital gains that maybe didn't have them a couple years ago because now people's portfolios just with their investments are making capital gains that they didn't have before. So it's an opportunity for people across the board, whether you're very wealthy or you're middle class or or whatever you you sold that created the capital gains, you have a place to put it. There's a vehicle there for you to do something with it as long as there's fine tuning by the IRS and the treasury to allow everyone to understand the benefits of the program. I think that's what we're missing and people are beginning to realize that now so that maybe something will happen because it's a fabulous program for lifting up the community, which is its primary purpose. I, I, yeah, I completely agree with you, and, and it is a fabulous program for doing just that and lifting up the community. You know, there's, there's a lot that, that can be done just from clarifying statements. Um, you know, like, like, I, like you know, just the difference between capital gain money versus non-capital gain money. Um, looking at, you know, trying to force, like one of the big things right now, as we all know, in the Opportunity Zone space is this December 31st guideline, or deadline, not guideline, deadline. Right. right? And, and, you know, we've got this funneling effect that, that's going to create a tidal wave, and then the tidal wave is going to crash because come January 1, then what? So what we're doing is, is instead of, like, you know, really looking at this and saying, how do we create and, and, and say that we know that there's a capital gain market space every year. I mean, there was $6.1 trillion just in tax year 2017. It'll be interesting to see what that number is for tax year 2018. But, you, had, you know, if we're talking about a trillion-dollar market cap of, of capital gains, you've got to be able to, to not just try to control the wave but let the tidal waves happen year over year. The foundation for how this program is written for a rainbow date of 2047 being the last of, of the program, at least as it stands right now, I think if they're smart, they'll do a 10-year extension on it, but 2037 being the last year that I can put money into a fund and hold for the 10-year period. So we've already got the foundation just to build a rolling deferment all the way up to 2037. If I put my money in 2020, great. I pay tax 2027. If I put my money in 2021, great. I pay tax 2028 on that. And give me my maximum step up. You will maximize the amount of money that, that will flow into this. 
All right. Well, let me let me ask a question then and say, um, I think that the the built-in time criteria is creating a lot of the confusion because people don't know if they invest now what's going to happen next year or if they don't invest or or I have the all of these different time constraints when I finally invest it's created a lot of confusion that makes people leery of doing anything for fear that they're going to get penalized because of the time issues and I think that's an important thing that new legislation needs to address to clarify that or uh, do something that relatively eliminates the, the insecurity created by time constraints and also makes it a program that doesn't appear to have a finite existence so that it is continuing. So even though there's dates of 2026 or 2037 or 2046, that it needs to continue and go past those so that investments can happen as time goes on and people aren't afraid because they don't they don't understand and that's the prime problem people don't understand what the they can't look to anything that's tangible that says this is how it's going to be and this is what it's going to be in the future and don't be afraid to do something today because it's still going to work 20 years from now Oh, you're absolutely right, and and it and it doesn't, you know, when you look at the when you look at the educational curve or the acceptance curve on anything that's brand new, you know, you, you have a piece of, you know, first an acknowledgement that something is real, i.e., yes, opportunity zones, opportunity, you know, initiative exists. Then you have a certain aspect of a awareness of it, which means that okay, it's not just that it's real and stuffed into a bill, but that people begin to know about it. Then you have an education period, which we all have been through consistently on, but then you also have an acceptance aspect of it. And it's not just an awareness and education, but you've got to, if you start chopping at, at, at the, the foundation by, you know, sprinkling in and, and bringing bills in that, that want to do away with the whole entire program before they even have the first year to report, what you start chipping away at, at early on is then the acceptance piece of this, which is where the investors are saying, I want to put my money into it. And the, and the thing about it is, is that you know, if you talk to investors, most investors, they want to put money in their backyard. They want to put money into opportunity right. zones, projects that's close to them because it's something that has a more impact to them than putting something that's 3,000 miles away into an opportunity zone. And so this has got something that is – it's never really been done before. It's a bipartisan support, and, but it's got to be given the time to grow. You know, I, I think I said in my video that, listen, you know, number one, you don't feed steak to a baby, and this is still a baby. Yes. Right. I mean, if we read the grand scheme of things, it, it is. Still, it's a, it's, I mean, it's first, it's its first real year. It's an infant right now. And number two, every baby goes through a teething phase at some point in time. If you're a parent, that means that you're up at night dealing with a lot of, you know, crying nights and stuff or from a teething baby. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that when we look at this program, you, you know, there's a, still an immense amount. Number one, how slow guidelines is coming out is, is ast astronomical. I mean, stuff that we got in Dude. April, we were expected to get last December. You know, to go five, right. six months, six, you know, eight months before another wave of guidelines, it's still, you know, it's like it's not giving everybody a clear enough picture. And the picture that we do have that is clear enough now, which is working – and, and is doable and, and people are investing into, you've got talking heads that want to kind of chip at that. And, um, you know, I, I think that the government can do better. I, I think that this is that program that's going to impact the country. And, and if they're really going to be serious about this, and it seems like they are legitimately, and I've talked to people on both sides um, that are heavily involved in, in how this has gotten rolled out, all at the very tip top of the government level. And, uh, my, what, I, what my biggest takeaway is, is that there's more overwhelming support for this program than what there really is naysayers. Um, oh, absolutely. We, I agree, uh, absolutely. The naysayers voice in this is what it is. And there's a lot that they, there's a lot the government still has up their sleeve, a lot, of, a lot of aces in the deck that they can still play to really, really take this thing and explode it like a rocket ship because it's got the potential to be. 
And and I think that it's typical of legislation, whether it's at the federal level or the state level or even the local level, governments tend to create legislation, create programs or, or pass laws without any true direction. They say, okay, here's the Opportunity Zone program, but we're not going to give you any direction. We're not going to give you any rules or regulations on how it should work or what needs to be, what's required of, of it so we can have something to uh, test its success. It's just here it is. Now you go play with it and do what you want with it and see what happens. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, oh, well, we can always change it. But so much time, as you say, David, so much time is basically wasted trying to figure out what should have happened before the program was ever even introduced. All of these, um, uh, all of this criteria should have been part of the initial uh, uh, release of the Opportunity Zone program so that time wouldn't be wasted and more people would take advantage of it initially. Because it, it, there is a lot, and, and as you said, the long-term job creation effect of opportunity zones is, is uh, it's just infinite because, it, for example, here in uh, North Las Vegas and in Henderson, we have Google coming in and we have Amazon coming in that are going to create uh, warehouses and uh, production locations. And so the job potential for just those two projects in Opportunity Zones is is great. And But nobody talks about that. They only talk about, oh, well, this is just a program for the very wealthy who everybody knows they're the only ones who have capital gains. So it's just, it's, it's basic ignorance on the part of what the program is really uh, capable of doing. And I don't mean ignorance in terms of being stupid. I just mean uneducated and not knowing what it could be, what the potential is. Well, I think that you know, one of the things that I think is getting lost in, uh, I'll say missing the forest from the trees, is that I, there's been a lot of overthinking almost. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I firmly believe is that what we do not want is government coming in and taking something that was designed to have an extreme amount of flexibility. Because keep in mind that what we're dealing with here is private equity. We're, we're dealing with a program that by intentionality and by bipartisan support circumvents the government and puts the ability to make a deal in two people's hands with contingencies and benefits in his own, out of his own, tax program, et cetera, right? But at the core of what we're talking about here is, you know, we need, we need the government's support in enhancing programs that are out there to be supportive of the OZ program. But what we don't want is them telling us exactly how to do things because then you take the, the for lack of better words, the art of the deal out of the mix. Because the fact that these are such private equity, how, how a fund can structure a deal into an investment could go a million and one different ways. True. And, and that's the beauty of it. Well, but what we've got to look at is saying, okay, at the end of the day, really what is the most important thing for this program? Well, it's the ability to understand it, it, the, what the metrics of the, are. Is it working or is it not working? And then to be able to, to, to modify those metrics without penalty to the, what the existing previous metrics were. So if I put money into an opportunity fund today and that opportunity fund puts money into a real estate development tomorrow and that's in an opportunity zone, three years from now, there's a good chance that with enough, that zone may no longer be classified as economically distressed. And so it should be redesignated, but you don't want to give penalty to the fund already making an investment and it now losing that classification of now that investment is no longer in a zone. So there's things that they should be looking at in not trying to say, how do we put handcuffs on this, but really, how do we help this plane fly better, further, faster to get to the destination in a safer manner with more people on board? Because that's exactly. what's going to bring the investors to the table more than what they already have. 
to where this becomes something where next year is a breakout year for businesses. We see more investors coming into opportunity funds next year. And we, what we begin to see is healthy growth. But we don't want to turn around and put that healthy, you know, stymie that growth now by too much regulation. What we need is just more clarity. In exactly. Exactly. Exactly, which is which is what I was trying to say when I was when I uh, said there needs to be rules and regulations so that they can understand not to stifle the program but to enhance the program so that people can understand it that it's a little bit of clarity involved and it supports the program to its primary purpose and not stifles it and and causes people to be afraid of even coming near an opportunity zone because they don't understand it because there isn't clarity in how it works and how to judge its success and and also how to um, deal with any negative aspects or or uh, to collect enough data so that you can look at it and judge whether it's successful or not and if it's not well, let's fine-tune it, let the market and the people involved fine-tune it to make it work better, not to to put handcuffs on it and stifle it by saying you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do that, but how can we support it and make it better? How can we enhance it into the future and, and make it continuing? And that, that's what uh, this program needs, and, and it needs voices and, you know, advocates, um, just more more out there. You know, when you look at where we're at in the education piece of it, I mean, if I talk, if I line five people up, one might know what Opportunity Zones are. And that's exactly. junky public. Yes, I mean, I've gone to my local bank, and they didn't know what they were, and they've got an Opportunity Zone three miles down the road. Isn't that you know? incredible? It's, it yeah, just boggles. And Ron and I have come across this everywhere we go that people – especially real estate people who should know, they, they're basically the primary people who should know about this, don't have a clue. They don't even know what an opportunity zone is, much less where they are or how they can, uh, uh, how they can do things within the, their own um, transactions to understand it and make it better. Financial people don't know what it is. Government people don't know what it is, even though they're the ones that are regulating it. They don't have an idea. It's just incredible the lack of knowledge out there about a program that is so beneficial to people across the board. Oh, I, I agree with you. And, 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 you know, I think, and I started to kind of go, going, just going back to just one second, you know, the missing the forest from the trees or overlooking some stuff. I think a lot of people are taking something that, and they're making this too complex early on, creating too much right. confusion. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that really I think it kind of helped us with our success is that we looked at it completely from a different lens. Number one, we weren't real estate people, and everybody and their brother jumped into this thing that was real estate in the beginning. We were, we're business people. We know business through and through. We're private equity raisers. This is what we do. We you know, business. And from a business standpoint, when you really strip away everything that's related to the tax benefit and calling it a fund, what is it at its core? It's a business. It's a business. It's a C-Corp. It's a partnership. It's a business at its core, right? It's basic. And it's very basic. It's very rudimentary. It's elementary. It's something that, that, that you know, Joe the landscape guy can, can you know, do on his own to help him grow his Joe the landscape business company. Exactly. And, yeah. Where it gets complicated at and, and, and where – and it's not that it's complicated. It's just that there's a lack of understanding. And that's in the, okay, I set up a business, but how do I raise money as a business? And that's what this is. An opportunity fund is raising money as a business. It's selling equity, raising capital, and then putting that capital to work. Just in this case, it's not to grow a business. It's not to sell more widgets. It's not to try to you know, hire more people or to get something patented. It's to invest, right? It's to re redeploy into zones, but it's a business. And so once you set the business up, now you got a capital raise on the business. You know, anybody can go find uh, how to cap, how to, you know, raise money for your business book for dummies 101 and all of a sudden read it and have an understanding on what it takes. 
because the fundamentals, the, the basics haven't changed, the valuation models, the, none of that stuff on what businesses do every day, day in and day out, all of that is applicable in this scenario, which is what makes this so attractive. And so with, because it has so much flexibility, it's not so constrained by sets of guidelines that completely put what you can and can't do in a box, but it's a business. And I think what people are doing is, is that they're overcomplicating thinking about all the rules that go to the application and the usage of the money versus looking at what it takes to be a business and run and raise and then deploy. And so what we get is we get a lot of confusion on the 90-10 rule, the 80-20 rule for investors, the 70-30 rule for, for uh, tangible assets, for, Q, you know, for uh, businesses, zone stock and partnerships. We, we get uh, the substantial improvement versus original use. We get all of these things that become basically the rules for how to spend the money and how to report your spending. But the rules to get to that point have been established. People have been doing it for decades now. Forever. Forever. So, and that's where I think that people aren't, you know, we looked at it and said, if we look at this from a business and everything that a business would do to get set up is exactly what it takes to set up an opportunity fund. So yes, when the government looked at it and said that, you know, anybody can set up a fund and self-certify, there's absolute truth in that. It's understanding the complexities of what goes on when you sell and raise money. That's right. where it comes in and then extreme confusion in the rules in spending the money. And, you know, I always encourage opportunity funds. Like, even if you have an, a, 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 an investment that you're going to put money into and you know it, you've got to spotlight it, you know that investment like the back of your hand, if you're not sure, you've got time. You've got six months before you've got to fully deploy. And as long as you identify and you've got a strong enough written schedule for deployment and everything else that goes along with it to meet the safe harbor provisions, you've got an extra 31 months on top of that. Give me a 37 months to spend your first dollar. So when you take that, and then you add it into reporting on something like that, now you have conflicts of interest when it comes to how are we gauging whether a program works, when really and honestly, some of these funds have 37 months before they got to deploy their capital. So it's going to be hard to gauge, almost up to a three-year, four-year period to try to gauge reporting metrics. And that's where I think that, you know, we can do better in that. I think we need less argument, more saying let's find what we think is going to be a viable way to say, hey, are these working? Um, but for, for John Q. Public, you know, an opportunity fund is something that, that they can set up, that they, that they can do. They just got to know the basics of it. Anybody can do this. If you know that, that's you true. But another thing, uh, uh, getting, getting, uh, switching the subject a little bit, David, uh, I know you guys are doing a lot of the events in the industry. You've got one that you uh, – you're, that's coming up next year, early next year, or what? We do. We, we're super excited by this event. It's called the Dealmakers Exchange. It's March 12, 2020, at the Virginia Beach Convention Center. Um, our intent is to do something a little different. Uh, everything that I've been to out there up to this point has been all educational. Uh, you know, a lot of speakers, uh, listening to them kind of on stage, how I've been a part of that, right? I've, I've not only spoken, I've hosted on stage. So... You know, I'm guilty of that too, but I, I feel like that the, now is the time to where it's time to start making deals, time, time to start getting stuff more connected. So we've been doing trade show style. Uh, we've got the Virginia Beach Convention Center. Um, we can fit 218 booths there. So what we're doing is the trade show. We're hoping to have 1,000 plus in attendance is what our goal is. And it is open to anybody that's in the Opportunity Zone space, whether you're an economic development agency, whether you've got a project looking for funding, whether you've got an Opportunity Zone looking for funding, uh, whether uh, we just we want we want to connect in a trade show type of environment. We believe that deals can be cultivated, investments can be cultivated. You know, you put a, uh, some fund managers and you put a group of investors and you just let nature take its course, and it's going to happen, right? You don't don't have to do much. Just put, bring them together. And that's what we're excited about. So it's the Dealmakers Exchange, and uh, tickets are on sale now. We've got a Christmas special going on for attendance. Um, it's $99 uh, to get in. Um, uh, you know, we're hoping to have a great event.
great event. Uh, you can find out more information about it. Uh, visit our website on the event at ozfunds, O-Z-F-U-N-D-S dot com. Wow. Yeah, I, I, can go to three, I can go to three Golden Knights games for, for uh, the, the $99 is nothing for that. That's, that's an amazing price. Uh, so let me get this straight. If I'm going to this event, I'm, let's say I'm, a, I'm a, a fund manager, I would be able to pitch my, my fund or my deal, my project, to uh, maybe a, a room full of investors there? Is that what you kind of envision? No, no. What I'm envisioning is, is have you ever, you know what SEMA is, the car show SEMA? Yes, yes. In Las Vegas? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Think it, that's what I've got. I, I've got, a, got a picture of grandeur in my mind where I, I envision, you know, we, what we've got, we're working with, you know, 12,000 square feet. We've got a lot of square footage for, for space and for people. Um, you know, two full conference halls that, uh, you know, they do car shows in. So I, I want people up walking around. I, you know, I, if you've got an opportunity fund, you know, you should have a booth at this event because there's going to be investors going to be there and they're going to walk into your booth and you're going to be able to strike a one-on-one conversation with them right then and there acting as the fund manager connecting Love with it. them in person. Yeah, yeah, if that's you're awesome. a project looking for an opportunity, looking for an opportunity fund, what better way to connect with opportunity funds than come set up, be a project, have a, have a booth there, and get to know the funds and other projects that are there. Synergize, create deals, get relationships to flow. You know, I, 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 there's been so much regurgitation, in my, in my opinion, of the exact same information to the exact same circle that, you know, I'm at this point trying to say, how do we really get this out there? You know, I talk to, you know, economic development agencies every day that are struggling with, the, with the, the, you know, connecting to opportunity funds every day. They got, they got projects up the yin-yang and have a hard time connecting with opportunity funds. Well, you know, it's, here's the opportunity. Here's the opportunity. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Because I think, I think the program, I think the program has reached a, a point where everybody has talked about opportunity zones what they are, what you do, how to create them, what, how to manage them, what you need, where the investors are, all of that basic information is out there. And that's all that, that's kind of spinning around and everybody is saying the same thing, talking the same talk to the same people. And now it needs to go to the next level. Now you need to say, okay, we know what opportunity zones are. We know how the program works. We know how to create it. Now, where are the projects? Where is the money? Let's actually start acting and doing and stop talking. Exactly. And here's opportunity exactly. to actually find something, whatever you're looking for, find it here at your event in, in March, March 12th, uh, 2020. And now here's your opportunity to stop talking and start doing. I look at it like this. If you can't get a deal made at our event, then you can't get a deal made, period. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like it's that simple. You know, I mean, if we're going through this effort of, you know, doing everything to bring investors into the group, to bring the economic development agencies in the group, to bring the projects together into the group, to bring the opportunity funds in, into the building. I mean, if, I, if, we, if we put everybody together, you get the right ingredients. If, if we can't make a good tasting sauce out of this, then I don't know what will. And well, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, all these people are listening to the podcast right now, David, and they and they're uh, they're on their computers buying tickets right now. That'd be nice. So, listen yeah, before we so. clear, be, yeah, before we close this out now, uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, uh, what's the best way to do that? If they have any questions, or maybe they want to continue this conversation with uh, you uh, personally, the best way or to get what? Hold of us is to go to go to our website, easydoit.com. It's e a z y d o i t dot com. Uh, we've got a lot of content out there um, that we're pushing, a lot of videos, a lot of ebooks, uh, you know, some other podcasts that we've done, some radio shows that we've done. We've got a lot of content material out there, definitely a lot of different uh, channels to be able to get in contact with us directly, depending on what your needs are, et cetera. But uh, I encourage you to visit, OZ, uh, visit us online at easydoit.com. Excellent. And Vicki, before this, this podcast started, I said that we were going to set the record straight here. So I think that we actually did it here with, with David with some with this information and all. Do uh, you have any closing comments on, on today's podcast? My only thing, the only thing I'd like to say finally is 
Anybody out there interested in Opportunity Zones, you owe it to yourself to go to David's event. It's called Deal Makers Exchange. It's March 20th or March 12th, 2020. It's in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And if you don't go register, sign up and go to it, well, you need to go to a different business. <laughs> Okay. And that's the, and that's the last thing I have to say. Excellent. And, 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 and David, also, thank you. I know you're really busy these days. I thank you so much for taking the time out today and, uh, you know, giving your thoughts to our audience. I really appreciate it. And like, like always, I hope we, we have you back on many, many shows because you, you really hit the nail on a lot of things as you, as you always do. So uh, appreciate guys, it very always much. a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Ron and Vicky. Thank you so much for having me guys. Great, great. And everyone out there, you're listening to the Mappable USA podcast at mappableusa.com. You can go to that website, scroll down, you'll see all our syndication sources that are growing every week. There's a place there for a guest tab. If you want to find out about how to get be on the guest on the show, like David was today, we'll, we'll fill out that form. We'll see what you can do about getting you on the show. So once again, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for all your support. And we'll be at you next week with another Mappable USA podcast. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.